Clive Staples Lewis tells us his own life story with a purpose. His is a journey toward belief in God. He was born in 1898, 42 years after Freud. He grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland. His grandfather was a Protestant minister. His father, Albert, a lawyer. His mother, Flora, was a mathematician. In 1907, they moved into Little Lee, which Albert had built for his wife. And there, they were a very happy family. I think Flora knew her son better than the father did. She gave him a good foundation in Latin and in French and in English. When he was five, Lewis told his family that he would no longer answer to the name of Clive. They were to call him Jack. I am a product of empty, sunlit rooms, indoor silences, attics explored in solitude. Here, my first stories were written and illustrated. They were an attempt to combine my two chief literary pleasures, dressed animals and knights in armor. Jack and his older brother Warren spent all their time together, playmates and companions. Together, they made a magical private world. Once, in those very early days, my brother Warren brought into the nursery a box which he had covered with moss and garnished with twigs and flowers. That was the first beauty I ever knew. It made me aware of nature as something cool, dewy, fresh, exuberant. Everything seems like a dream. Anything seems possible. And all sorts of ideas float through your mind. It was something quite different from ordinary life and even from ordinary pleasure. Something, as they would now say, in another dimension. It was a sensation of desire. But before I knew what I desired, the desire was gone. The world turned commonplace again. Throughout his life, Lewis would often remember the feeling aroused in him by the toy garden. He named that feeling joy. There's a pang of desire that this garden brings back, as though he once was someplace which is now beyond his reach. It's lost to him, and he wants desperately to return to that. I must now turn to a great loss that befell our family when my mother became ill. There were voices and comings and goings all over the house. Our whole existence changed into something alien and menacing as the house became full of strange smells and midnight noises. what I'd been taught, that prayers offered in faith would be granted. 
I set myself to produce by willpower a firm belief that my prayers for her recovery would be successful. The thing hadn't worked. With my mother's death, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable, disappeared from my life. And there has never been, really, any sense of security and snugness since. I have not quite succeeded in growing up on that point. There is still too much of Mummy's lost little boy about me. My father's good qualities, as well as his weaknesses, incapacitated him for the task of bringing up two noisy and mischievous schoolboys. Albert was distraught. Now, we all know that, if possible, the, the, the survivor needs to be strong for the children. But in this case, I think the children were simply partly devastated by the fact that not only had their mother died, but their father was falling apart in front of them. One day, my brother made a tent. He used a dust sheet from the attic and a stepladder taken from the house and turned into tent poles. My father came home from work. Then the lightning flashed and the thunder roared. He said he would close the house and we should be sent away to America. Being still a boy, I believed in these threats. I would awake at night, and if I did not immediately hear my brother's breathing from the neighboring bed, I often suspected my father and he had secretly risen while I slept and gone off to America, that I was finally abandoned. No more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. The most heart-wrenching episode in all of Lewis's literature, I think, happens in The Magician's Nephew, when the little boy picks the apple that Aslan sent him for and knows that his mother lies dying at home in England and realizes that this magic apple could cure her. And the witch says, take it, take just a slice of it. The lion will never know and it will cure your mother. But the little boy Diggory doesn't do it. He brings it back to Aslan and is so surprised when Aslan gives him a piece and says, take it back. Well, the little boy takes the apple back to his dying mother and gives it to her. And we see the middle-aged C.S. Lewis writing in his book of fantasy what he couldn't achieve in life. Jack Lewis was sent to boarding school in England. He had lost his mother and been abandoned by his father and the faith that had failed him. When he went to boarding school, C.S. Lewis reacted against what he felt was a disappointing and dull religious faith. The fussy, time-wasting botheration of it all. Hymns were extremely disagreeable to me. Of all musical instruments, I liked the organ least. Christianity was mainly associated, for me, with ugly architecture, ugly music, and bad poetry. School life was almost wholly dominated by the social struggle. 
to get on, to arrive. The rivalry was fierce. The prizes glittering. The hell of failure severe. I came to hate school. I never ceased by letter or by word of mouth to beg my father that I might be taken away. At last, when Jack turned 16, Albert, his father, agreed to take him out of school to study with a private tutor. His name was William Kirkpatrick, called the Great Knock by his students. If ever a man came close to being a purely logical entity, that man was the Great Knock. He had been a Presbyterian and was now an atheist. I suppose familiar with The Great Knock had been Albert Lewis's tutor, had been Warren Lewis's tutor, was a very severe logician. You know, Lewis records his first meeting with the Great Knock in an attempt to make small talk. So he said something like, um, it's a nice day. And the Great Knock said, what do you mean by nice? And on what grounds do you attribute those qualities to this day? And Lewis realized that this is not a man to make small talk with. He was the very man who taught me to think. A hard, satirical atheist. A man as honest as daylight. His attitude to Christianity was, for me, the beginning of adult thinking. The impression I got was that religion in general, though utterly false, was a natural growth, a kind of endemic nonsense into which humanity tended to blunder. In 1914, the First World War engulfed Europe. Three years later, at the age of 17, Lewis won a coveted scholarship to Oxford University. But before his freshman year was over, he decided to enlist in the British Army. Among his classmates going to the battlefront was his friend, Paddy Moore. Lewis was a visitor to the Moore home and was received like a member of the family. And so they swore to each other the following. If one of them died and the other lived in the war, the survivor would take care of the dead comrade's family. The war was a kind of crusade to the youth of Europe. They were convinced that the enemy were demons. They were convinced that theirs was a cause worth dying for. And nine million did. I have gone to sleep marching and woken again and found myself still marching. The frights, the cold, the smell of high explosive. The landscape of sheer earth without a blade of grass. The horribly smashed men still moving like half crushed beetles. Lewis was on intimate terms with pain. He was wounded in World War I. He saw the sergeant who had saved his life blown up next to him. In other words, he knew, as, as that generation did, the horrors of the Great War. He thought God was at fault for causing the suffering he saw in the First World War. That was God's fault. He shouldn't have allowed that to happen. He thought he was a blackguard. That is the way he described God in his own poetry. 14th of May, 1918. Paddy has been missing for over a month and is almost certainly dead. Of all my own particular set at Oxford, he has been the first to go. And it is a bitter irony to remember that he was always certain that he would come through. After the war, Lewis returned to Oxford. Good to his word, he set up house with his dead comrade's mother and sister, Janie and Maureen Moore. She was mother surrogate. She was a companion. And of course, she was a comfort to him as well. 
I mean, there was this household. It was home for Lewis. Home, this idea of home. This matters very much. The early loss of my mother, great unhappiness at school, and the shadow of the last war, and presently the experience of it, had given me a very pessimistic view of existence. My atheism was based on it. In 1922, Jack Lewis took his degree in classics and philosophy from Oxford University. At the time, reason and logic dominated academic thinking. Lewis describes the new psychology of Freud, which made a tremendous impact upon undergraduates, particularly somebody like Lewis, whose life was so imaginative. The new psychology was at that time sweeping through us all. We were all influenced. We were all concerned about fantasy or wishful thinking. I formed the resolution of always judging and acting with the greatest good sense. He was saying that all youth at that time were trying to escape from wish fulfillment dreams. They got that from Freud. And they wanted to, in one way, spit on the images of their youth and go on to they knew not what, but anyway, leave that behind because it was juvenile. Lewis was writing a long poem called Dimer. In it, he portrayed belief in God as a tempting illusion, one that had to be resisted. But he found that in his own life, he wasn't so certain. The question of God's existence would not let him go. I was, at that time, living like many atheists in a world of contradictions. I maintained that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. I was equally angry with him for creating a world. Why should creatures have the burden of existence forced on them without their consent? More than anything, Lewis wanted to write poetry. And for that, he needed the security of an academic career. He applied for teaching jobs at Oxford, but college after college turned him down. I was attacked by a series of gloomy thoughts about professional and literary failure. Such a rage against poverty and fear and all the infernal net I seemed to be in that I went out and mowed the lawn and cursed all the gods for half an hour. Lewis's first ambition, a burning ambition from the age of about 15, was to be a poet, a great poet. I could not say simply that I desired not my fame, but that of the poem, nor was the feeling a disinterested love for Dimer simply as a poem. It was a desire that something that I recognized as my own should publicly be found good. His hopes were finally fulfilled in 1925. Maudlin College made him a fellow. The next year, he found a publisher for his long poem, Dimer. Success at last. But it was not enough. All the books were beginning to turn against me. Indeed, I must have been as blind as a bat not to have seen long before the ludicrous contradiction between my theory of life and my actual experiences as a reader. The most religious were clearly those on whom I could really feed. The poetry he really cared about was not Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein, all these years, the greatest pleasure he ever had was from Christian poetry. Things like uh, Spencer, uh, Milton, all of these great poets. And yet he found out that he was reading them, as he later said, with the point left out. The same thing was happening with his friends. The people he thought he should have liked were the college atheists. But the ones he really liked were Tolkien, 
a practicing, very devout Catholic. Oh, when Barfield, who asks all the right questions. Um, so, so far, I'm really I can only describe it as the great war between Barfield and me. When I set out to correct his heresies, I find that he had decided to correct mine. And then we went at it, hammer and tongs, far into the night. Night after night. Barfield believed that the imagination plays a very important part in how we know. He rejected the model that science is the only way to, to truth, to acquiring truth. He felt that um, the imagination was, lay behind even the work of science. It gave meaning to, to uh, propositions. And so he felt that Lewis was missing out in his whole approach to reality on what made knowledge possible. I was suddenly compelled to read the Hippolytus of Euripides. O oh God, bring me to the sea's end, to the Hesperides, sisters of evening, who sing alone in their islands where the golden apples grow, and a lord of oceans guards the way from all who would sail into their night blue harbors. Let me escape to the rim of the world, where the tremendous firmament meets the earth, and Atlas holds the universe in his palms. For there, in the palace of Zeus, wells of ambrosia pour through the chambers, while the sacred earth lavishes life, and time adds his years only to heaven's happiness. I was off once more into the land of longing, my heart at once broken and exalted as it had never been since the old days. I was overwhelmed. I called it joy. When Lewis talks about joy, he talks about something that he labels the central theme of his whole life. But what he means by joy is not the satisfaction of a desire, but a desire that is more desirable than any satisfaction. There was no doubt joy was a desire, but a desire is turned not to itself, but to an object. I had been wrong in supposing that I desired for joy itself. All value lay in that of which joy was the desiring, the naked other, unknown, undefined, desired. I did not yet ask, who is desired? The very experience of joy that Lewis had was uh, an arrow that led to the target of belief in God. Lewis argued innate, deep desires do not exist unless they correspond to something that can satisfy them. If there is hunger, there is food. If there is sexual desire, there is sex. If there is curiosity, there is knowledge. So if there is the desire for this thing that is beyond this world, there must be something beyond this world. Lewis was still resisting, but growing tired from the struggle. The fox had now been dislodged from the wood and was running in the open, bedraggled and weary, the hounds barely a field behind. The odd thing was that before God closed in on me, I was, in fact, offered what now appears to be a moment of wholly free choice. I was going up Headington Hill on the top of a bus. Without words, and almost without images, a fact about myself was somehow presented to me. I became aware that I was holding something at bay. I felt myself being given a free choice. I could open the door or keep it shut. I chose to open. I felt as if I were a man of snow, at long last beginning to melt. Drip, drip. And presently, trickle, trickle. I had always wanted, above all things, not to be interfered with. 
I had wanted, <laughs> mad wish, to call my soul my own. I had been far more anxious to avoid suffering than to achieve delight. You must picture me alone in that room at Magdalen, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. Total surrender. The absolute leap in the dark were demanded. I gave in, and admitted that God was God. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. God was not an illusion to C.S. Lewis. In 1931. He had converted to belief in God. He was a commanding presence in tutorials and in the lecture halls of Magdalen College. But beneath the outward mask of confidence and professional success, he still struggled with his faith. I am appalled to see how much of the change I had thought I had undergone lately was only imaginary. For the first time, I examined myself with a serious, practical purpose, and there I found a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions. Lewis still was very much aware of his own flaws, his shortcomings, his short temper, his impatience, you know, with ignorance,、uh, his lack of charity toward other human beings. But he was aware that he was called to be differently with them. Depth under depth of self-love and self-admiration. Pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is essentially competitive in a way the other vices are not. Pride is a spiritual cancer. It is my besetting sin. The real work seems still to be done. When Lewis first converted, he wasn't happy because the first thing that happened to him was the realization that God was God and that he was not his own God. God was a transcendental interferer, barging into Lewis's life and saying, "You're not God. I am God." It must be understood that my conversion at that point was only to theism, pure and simple. I knew nothing yet about the incarnation. The God to whom I surrendered was sheerly non-human. Lewis believed there was a God, but he did not yet have a specific way to worship Him. He was attracted to Hinduism and Christianity. I think Lewis made a conventional objection to Christianity that it's so much like other religions: dying and rising gods, and、uh, redemption from sin, and the triumph of life over death. These seem to be common patterns, so they could be explained psychologically instead of historically. And then one of his friends, who was an atheist, who looked at the life of Christ and said, "Rum thing seems to have really happened once," and that shocked Lewis. If he, the cynic of cynics, the toughest of toughs, were not, as I would still have put it, safe, where could I turn? Was there then no escape? He was reading G.K. Chesterton because Chesterton tells, in effect, the history of the world and how it was leading up to the incarnation. A great man knows he is not God. And the greater he is, the better he knows it. The Gospels declare that this mysterious Maker of the world has visited his world in person. 
the most that any religious prophet has said was that he was the true servant of such a being. But that the creator was present in the daily life of the Roman Empire, that is something unlike anything else in nature. It is the one great startling statement that man has made since he spoke his first articulate word. It makes dust and nonsense of comparative religion. He begins to read the New Testament in Greek. He begins to understand that the New Testament is not just a set of stories, but actually a witness to the presence of a historical human being who embodied the Spirit of God, that this person did not sin. And so this was only possible if this person truly was God in human form. The claims that Christians believe actually came from Jesus are either absolutely true, and this argument stems from Chesterton, either they're absolutely true or Jesus needs to be confined to the lunatic fringe. To believe in some sort of a God is fairly comfortable. It's more inconvenient to believe in a God who's so specific and so particular that you can say, there he is in history, there are his words, there are my responsibilities, I can't make it up. As I drew near to Christianity, I felt a resistance almost as strong as my previous resistance to theism. As strong, but shorter lived, for I understood it better. At each step, one had less chance to call one's soul one's own. Lewis simply did not understand what Christ fitted into it until finally that night in 1931, he had invited Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, two of his closest friends, to Morton College. It was a windy night. They went along before dinner. They walked along Addison's Walk, talking about mythology. They stayed up to 4 a.m., and Tolkien did his work well. What Tolkien showed me was this, that if I met the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, I didn't mind it at all. I was mysteriously moved by it. The reason was that in pagan stories, I was prepared to feel the myth as profound. Now, the story of Christ is simply a true myth. His imaginative questionings and his imaginative longings came together by focusing upon the, the Christian Gospels, as um, outlined by Tolkien and, and Dyson. He was a literary critic. And as such, he said, I know myth when I see it, I know legend when I see it, and I know an eyewitness account when I see it. I recognize metaphor when it's there. All of this is in the Bible. All of it is inspired. But far from all of it is literal history. Well, Dyson and Tolkien pointed out that the only difference was we don't know that Osiris walked the earth, but Jesus left footprints. People saw him and talked about it. As we continued walking, we were interrupted by a rush of wind which came so suddenly on a still warm evening and sent so many leaves pattering down that we thought it was raining. We all held our breath, appreciating the ecstasy of such a moment. I think it would be a mistake to think that argument converted C.S. Lewis because he thinks that we have to be oblique. We can't look at things directly. They escape us. This is what his attempted at introspection taught him. When you're thinking, and now you start to think about your thinking, you're not thinking about the original object anymore. 
You know, I'm thinking about baseball. Now I'm thinking about how I'm thinking about baseball. I'm not thinking about baseball anymore, you see. It's very elusive. So Lewis understood that we had to have an oblique approach. As he put it, you have to sneak past the watchful dragons of self-consciousness. I know very well when, but hardly how the final step was taken. I went with my brother to have a picnic at Whipsnade Zoo. We started in fog, but by the end of our journey, the sun was shining. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. I had not exactly spent the journey in thought, nor in great emotion. It was more like when a man, after a long sleep, becomes aware that he is now awake. But what of joy? To tell you the truth, the subject has lost nearly all interest for me since I became a Christian. It was valuable only as a pointer to something other and outer. For Lewis, true happiness could only be found in relationship with God. When he entered into this relationship, it changed his life. To believe in God and to pray were the beginning of my extroversion. I had been taken out of myself. Lewis was a bachelor living with Mrs. Moore and her daughter Maureen, the mother and sister of a dead comrade from the First World War. They were family to him. After he embraced faith, Lewis broadened his circle of friends. He was drawn more and more to the writers and scholars at Oxford who shared his faith. My happiest hours are spent sitting up till the small hours in someone's college rooms talking nonsense, poetry, theology, metaphysics, over beer, tea and pipes. There's no sound I like better than adult male laughter. The group gathered weekly to talk, drink, and read their works. Literary critics Hugo Dyson and Owen Barfield, medievalist J.R.R. Tolkien, writer and editor Charles Williams, Lewis and his brother Warren. They called themselves the Inklings. The Inklings actually began around 1933, and Tolkien and Lewis were the were, the, were at the core of it, and they invited friends along. In the 1930s, it was a time when modernism was very strong, both as a literary movement and philosophically, sweeping away the old idealism and putting forward the scientific model as the only means to truth. Lewis and his friends passionately resisted this movement, and the Inklings actually functioned as a kind of an oasis to stand against this trend and to give encouragement to each other to develop their writings in a consciously Christian way. To belong to a group of real friends is to be armed against influences from without. The public opinion within the group may be tiny, but it matters more than the opinion of 10,000 outsiders. Lewis and Tolkien felt that the kind of stories they liked weren't being written and that as nobody else was doing it, they should do it themselves. One stage, they tossed a coin to see who would write a time story and who would write a space story. Tolkien got the time story, which became The Lord of the Rings, and Lewis got the space story, which became the trilogy Out of the Silent Planet. Lewis began to realize all kinds of theological ideas could be smuggled into people's minds by writing good stories which would inculcate these kind of um, concepts. All this time Lewis had been spinning his wheels. Then came the conversion. What happened was, when he was converted, he really lost all interest in himself. I can't underscore that enough. 
what a change that may that was in the, that man he just lost his interest in himself not in the things that he was interested in not in poetry he was technically one of the most proficient men for writing you could think of but he had nothing to say then along came an invitation to preach in saint mary the virgin which is one of the oddest things that they would ask him but they knew he was interested in theology anyway he preached this remarkable sermon. He became this great defender of the faith. He said, I realized that the one real service I could provide my fellow Christians was to explain and defend the faith to them because you know, he had this extraordinary rhetorical gift. So he became, as his friends saw, very selfless and looked outside of himself. There was a lot of resistance from his colleagues in Oxford they felt that whereas a Don might write detective stories, it was another matter when it came to writing popular theology. They had the feeling that uh, it should be the specialist theologians that wrote on theology. Lewis was a very intellectual person, a brilliant mind, but at the heartbeat of all his work is a preoccupation with the whole idea of human love. He wrote a book called The Four Loves, which is about the, the four kinds of, of love that we experience. Affection for family and friends, sexual love, these Lewis defined much as Freud would have. Then he added a fourth category, love of God. Divine gift love in a man enables him to love what is not naturally lovable. Lepers, criminals, enemies, morons. Lewis is differentiating between different experiences of love that all human beings have and identifying that it is natural to love one's brother, one's family members, enter into relationships with friends, uh, male and female, to enter into erotic lo and romantic love. But he also recognized this mysterious realm of love that did not have a direct and immediate personal benefit and he identified that as agape, or a selfless love, a love that was truly committed to the well-being of the other, and passionately so. What agape means in the New Testament is the love of God, the love that God has to us. And that love mediated and explained by Christ is absolutely egalitarian. Agape, or charity, is a scandal to reason because it means loving people not just in terms of justice or what they deserve but simply loving them absolutely for Freud uh, what we're talking about as love uh, he would designate as eros but eros as desire sought an object in other words it was a quantum of energy that goes in search of satisfaction with and other. That's a far cry from what Lewis understood to be the human manifestations of agape, because in, in that definition of love, there is, there is a degree of selflessness. In other words, eros has an aim, it has a target, it has an object, it has an ulterior motive. Uh, agape doesn't. <laughs> And the love that's being talked about in uh, love your neighbor exhortation is not necessarily the love that comes easy, the love that is full of emotion, uh, of good feeling. It is a love that extends to all of other human beings because we are of the same species. We are all creatures who are children of God. Lewis did not accept Freud's view that morality evolved from the harsh lessons of human experience. To him, morality came from God. It was a message he brought to a mass audience in the years of the Second World War. Even as soldiers fought overseas, German planes attacked the cities and shipyards of Britain. That's the sound that became part of the...
endangered the life of every man, woman, and child. Military and civilians alike were constantly in danger. The simple security of everyday life was gone. Parents feared for the safety of their children, and the government organized massive evacuations of the youngest, the most vulnerable, to the countryside. Four of these evacuees were sent to Lewis's home in Oxfordshire. This had enormous impact on Lewis. He'd been living with Mrs. Moore, and they'd been joined by his brother. It was a relatively small household, and he was very attracted to these young children, enjoying their zest as they explored the grounds of the kiln and discovered the pond in the distance and found the chickens. And it, to them, it was almost like coming to a farm. This inspired him to start writing a story about four children who came as evacuees to a house in the country. One of the children had asked Lewis whether there was anything behind the big old wardrobe and if she could open it. The question sparked his imagination. Several years later, he was able to pick this story up and it became The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the first of the Chronicles of Narnia, which of course is about four evacuees who come to the house of an old professor in the countryside. The Narnia stories, like Lewis's early science fiction, were allegories of the Christian faith. They told the tale of children who visited a magic land where good fought evil for power over the world. On this journey, the children encountered Aslan the lion, who returned to redeem humankind. He has a mediator between God and human beings in the form of Aslan, who's very approachable and yet also is quite frightening. And it's a beautiful picture of a Christian view of faith. But outside the oasis of the countryside, the war was still raging. Every night, people who were huddled in shelters or confined to their homes tuned to the radio for news of the battlefront. In the face of the chaos, uncertainty and cruelty of war, many questioned the existence of a loving God. People in the cities with the bombs falling on them were facing issues of life and death and people losing their loved ones in war and it's a, it's a huge issue. The director of religious programming at the BBC asked C.S. Lewis to give some broadcast talks about faith. Lewis at first was a bit uncertain. He didn't like traveling to London and he didn't like the radio, but he felt a sense of duty to oblige and he prepared the first of his series of talks to do with the moral law. It started as an experiment, just five broadcasts, 15 minutes each. Lewis was told to write as if he were speaking to the average citizen. The next step is from being mere creatures to being sons of God. We Christians don't call it evolution because we believe it isn't something coming up out of blind nature, but something coming down from the world of light and power and knowledge beyond all nature. It was so successful, the BBC couldn't get enough. They had so many replies begging them to get Lewis back. The first five talks were followed by another five, and then another. History isn't just a story of bad people doing bad things. It's quite as much a story of people trying to do good things. But somehow something goes wrong. These radio broadcasts were collected in the best-selling book Mere Christianity. The 1940s were Lewis's most prolific years. He wrote The Screwtape Letters, in which a senior devil teaches a young apprentice the tools of the trade, and The Problem of Pain, a treatise on suffering. Lewis 
picked up this pen in 1939, and by the time he put it down, when the war was won in 1945, he had given Britain and the United States its major apologetics for Christianity. If there was a controlling power outside the universe, the only way in which we could expect it to show itself would be inside ourselves as an influence or a command trying to get us to behave in a certain way. And that is just what we find in ourselves. The existence of an indisputable moral law was central to Lewis's beliefs. For him, the fact that we have a conscience points undeniably to a creator. You might be in a dilemma where you you, you need to rescue somebody who's drowning and you, you're risking your own life in the process. But the moral law um, um, put, puts that obligation above your own instinct for self-survival. There has never been a society in history which thought that courage and justice and charity and honesty were vices and that uh, lying and cheating and stealing and uh, raping and betraying were virtues. This rule of right and wrong must somehow be a real thing, not made up by ourselves. If all of humanity is subject to moral obligation, what's the source of that moral obligation? How could it be something less than humanity? How could it be just our genes or our, our past history or our influences or our, our biology? So from the moral law to a, a moral lawgiver, Lewis argues that if we were looking for evidence of a God who cares about us as individuals, where could you more likely look than within your own heart at this very central concept of what's right and what's wrong? And there it is. In the one place where you think you might most learn something about God, that's exactly where you find it. And not only does it tell you something about the fact that there is a spiritual nature that is somehow written within our hearts, but it also tells you something about the nature of God himself, which is that he is a good and holy God, that what we have there is a glimpse of what he stands for. By the 1950s, C.S. Lewis had become a famous figure and the most popular spokesperson for Christianity in the English-speaking world. Living and working in Oxford for over 30 years, he was content and had no plans to change. He was a bachelor, leading a chaste life. There was no reason for him to think he would never be anything other than celibate. Warren was never anything other than celibate. And of course, when Joy Davidman came along, kismet. Joy Davidman was a writer, a novelist and a poet from New York. She grew up in a, a Jewish background and she came across the writings of C.S. Lewis when she was an atheist and a, and a Marxist and started corresponding with Lewis. She told Lewis in her letters that she had embraced the Christian faith in part because of his writing. Lewis got lots of letters from eligible ladies wanting more than just advice about Christian problems. Why would Joy be any different? Well, she was different. She was different first because she was very, very smart. She knew Lewis's work. She was a poet herself. She was a novelist herself. And she was his match in what Owen Barfield called dialectical obstetrics. Lewis married Helen Joy Davidman so that she would not be deported. But as they became closer and closer friends, they fell in love. When two people who discover they are on the same secret road are of different sexes, the friendship which arises between them will very easily pass into erotic love. 
At the time they were married, Joy and Lewis knew that she had bone cancer. I am very shortly to be both a bridegroom and a widower. Lewis turned to a former pupil who had become a priest, Peter Bide. Peter Bide comes to the hospital and Lewis asks if this man, who has some reputation for possessing a healing gift, would place his hands upon Joy and pray that she be healed. Peter Bide does this and lays his hand upon Lewis, who prays that he will get the pain that Joy is suffering, because the, the pain is ferocious. And of course, Joy is expected to die within a day or two. She doesn't. In fact, she starts to get better. <laughs> Within a few months, x-rays show that her pelvis has grown back. The bone has regenerated. Doctors cannot explain this. After her remission, Joy moved into the Lewis home with her two sons, David, 11, and Douglas, 13. I never expected to have in my 60s that happiness that passed me by in my 20s. For those few years, Helen and I feasted on love. Her great otherworldly ambition in life was to go to Greece. She'd wanted this since she was a young girl. They went to Mycenae, they went to Crete, they went to Rhodes. Joy climbed all the way up to the Acropolis. It was a wonderful bonus. And it was one of the happiest periods of Lewis's life. But the cancer returned. Joy and C.S. Lewis were separated by death on July 14, 1960. Why did you take such trouble to force this creature out of its shell? If it's now doomed to crawl back, to be sucked back into it. Where is God? What pitiable cant to say she will live forever in my memory. Live. That is exactly what she won't do. What's left? A corpse, a memory, a ghost. Three more ways of spelling the word dead. A Grief Observed is Lewis's description of the journey he took after Joy's death. A portrait of grief and a struggle with his own faith. Talk to me about the truth of religion, and I'll listen gladly. Talk to me about the duty of religion, and I'll listen submissively. But don't come talking to me about the consolation of religion, or I shall suspect that you don't understand. The conclusion is not, so there's no God after all. But, so this is what God is really like. The cosmic sadist, the spiteful imbecile. He lashes out at God, and he says, how can you expect us to live this way? Very much like Job. Very honestly, he doesn't just argue. He emotes, the whole of his being is there in front of God. It's a deep trust in God that allows him to give vent to his distrust. From a rational point of view, what grounds has Helen's death given me for doubting all that I believe? Should it, for a sane man, make quite such a difference as this? No. And it wouldn't, for a man whose faith had been real faith. The case is too plain. If my house has collapsed at one blow, 
it is because it was a house of cards. Indeed, it's likely enough that what I shall call, if it happens, a restoration of faith, will turn out to be only one more house of cards. Something quite unexpected has happened. Came this morning early. Suddenly, at the very moment when so far I mourned Helen least, I remembered her best. Imagine a man in total darkness. He thinks he is in a cellar or a dungeon. Then there comes a sound. He thinks it might be a sound from far off. Waves or wind-blown trees or cattle half a mile away. And if so, it proves he's not in a cellar, but free, in the open air. Lord, are these your real terms? Can I meet Helen again only if I learn to love you so much I don't care whether I meet her or not? When I lay these questions before God, I get no answer. But a rather special sort of no answer. It is not the locked door. It is more like a silent gaze as though he shook his head like peace child you don't understand how wicked it would be if we could to call the dead back she said not to me but to the chaplain I am at peace with God. She smiled, but not at me. Two years after his wife's death, C.S. Lewis began to have problems with his heart. He fell into a long coma and then unexpectedly recovered. It would have been a luxuriously easy passage, and one almost regrets having the door shut in one's face. To be brought back to life and have all one's dying to do again was rather hard. I would like everything to be immemorial. To have the same old horizons, the same garden, the same smells and sounds, always there changeless. Autumn is really the best of the seasons and I'm not sure that old age isn't the best part of life but of course like autumn it doesn't last. Clive Staples Lewis died three years after his wife in 1963. Can you not see death as the friend and deliverer? It means stripping off that body which is tormenting you. What are you afraid of? Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? Is it possible that Freud and Lewis represent conflicting parts of ourselves a part of us that yearns for a relationship with the source of all joy hope and happiness 
as described by Lewis, and another part that raises its fist in defiance and says with Freud, I will not surrender. Whatever part we choose to express will determine our purpose, our identity, and our whole philosophy of life.